Hey guys, we are the Latter-day Disciples. Our team is dedicated to helping you boldly live the gospel, recognize the signs of the times, and prepare for the return of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We invite you to join us in our mission through our daily and weekly podcast series, connecting with us on social media, and visiting latterdaydisciples.com. We pray you are enlightened and empowered through this podcast episode. Thank you for joining us. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Latter-day Disciples podcast. I'm so grateful to be joined today by my new friend, Jared Rubalcaba. Jared is the co-owner of Forbidden Adventure, which is a tour company that specializes in esoteric, religious, cultural, and historical travel to destinations all over the world. Their mission is to provide meaningful and transformative experiences to the intentional traveler looking to capture knowledge, wisdom, and life-changing self-discovery. Jared also serves as a guide for some of their most frequented destinations, including Peru, England, Scotland, and of course, his beloved Egypt. Jared received his Bachelor of Science in Outdoor Leadership Training, which has served as his foundation of experience management centered around learning and teaching others recreationally, professionally, and spiritually. For Jared, the connection between nature and spiritual nourishment is inseparable. As a young adult, Jared served a two-year ecclesiastical mission on the Kitabas Islands. Hopefully I said that right. <laughs> but his spiritual tutelage started at a much younger age and has lasted throughout his adult life as he's explored various religious religions and scriptural texts from many sects of Christianity throughout history, Taoism, Buddhism, indigenous creeds and rituals, Near Eastern religions, Gnosticism, and Hermeticism. His years of religious studies have been the prelude to, and to encountering the truths hidden in the symbols, rituals, hieroglyphs, and architecture of Egypt. For the past several years, his focus has been on the oldest religious text in the world, which is the ancient Egyptian pyramid texts and has recently completed his own translation of the Pyramid of Unas. Jared married up to a woman entirely too good for him, and together they have two deep-thinking and very funny boys. Jared, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Megan. And kudos to your wife for writing that awesome biography. <laughs> All righty. Okay, so we have so much that I'm I'm so thrilled to talk to you today about ancient Egypt and some of the slim similarities and some of the patterns of truth that we can garnish from their practice, their worship, and particularly their temples. So thank you so much for joining us. Can you give us a little bit of background on you and ancient Egypt? How did that love story start and where is it taking you so far? Yeah, sure. Um, well, you, you said it, looking for those patterns of truth, right? And um, I have a background with a lot of different um, religions in my upbringing. And that was something that I always found fascinating was if you can just become a little flexible with terms, you know, and the actual vocabulary and how we speak, uh, there's a lot more similarities than differences and, and throughout the world, right? In different cultures and traditions and religions. And I was always fascinated with that. And, um, as one studies world religions in general, it can become quite apparent to, to many that they seem to converge, right? The further back you go, they seem to converge at this common point of origin. And, um, you know, let's say for instance, whether that might be Adam and Eve, right? If they have all of this truth and then it just disseminates from there as it gets spread around the world. And so we might, expect to find fragments of truth everywhere, right? Um, if all truth can be circumscribed into one great whole, we would expect that, uh, you know, we need to look for truth everywhere to be able to complete that whole. And, uh, you know, for me, uh, it started really with, with language. Uh, I was studying with um, a mentor of mine and an eminent uh, classicist John Hall and uh, you know we were going through the New Testament in Greek in particular we, we studied a lot of scriptures but in particular we were going through the New Testament in Greek this is really where the light went on for me where it read so different if, when you look at something in the original language because you know as a translator 
you're always having to make choices, right? These words mean lots of different things and you have to choose which word you're going to implement in your translation. So if you now look at all of the other options and you can apply your experience, your bias, even your perspective onto that, you might see something totally different. And passages that you've read the same your whole life can read completely different. And so for me, I just started going further and further back. And I've always been a, a huge fan of, of Hugh Nibley, which by the way, I mean, if you wanna discuss uh, connections between Egypt and your own tradition with, with, with uh, yeah, with respect to that, you, you're not gonna find better source than, than Hugh Nibley. I mean, he's written thousands upon thousands of pages uh, that you know are far better than my clumsy efforts to explain. But, um, I, so I did the same thing with Egypt, right? I, I got tired of just reading what somebody else said the Egyptians believed or thought. And, you know, if you're trying to go as far back as you can, well, there's not an older source than Egypt, right? If all of these things seem to converge and we tend to find more and more valuable things the further back we go, uh, I wanted to look at Egypt and not just read commentary. So I just started with the text and trying to you know, monkey my way through it, looking at words here and there, and then began an earnest study of the language um, that, that continues <laughs> to this day, right? And um, it has just opened up for me. I continually just find gold there. It's a gold mine in terms of uh, how it relates to, again, my own perspective. Um, in the video that I released not long ago on mother, daughter, queen, and priestess in ancient Egypt, I alluded to that very fact um, of part of that search was an interest in a mother in heaven, right? My perspective was that she's a given and I wasn't trying to prove her existence. And you can't find a better source for that really than in Egypt. You know, she's splashed across every wall and she's central to every text. The oldest religious text in the entire world, as far as we know, Literally, the opening lines are uttered by the mother toward her child, you know, and it's just beautiful stuff, and um, it resonates with me. Uh, so yeah, that's that's I, I love study, I love reading, uh, but it's all really trivia, right? Unless it can be backed up with inner experience and direct experience of these things, or memory, or the recognition of truth, right? Mm -hmm. so that's yeah. kind of started with Egypt. I love that. And I love that, that underpinning foundational search for truth that you were talking about throughout the whole thing. And one of the things that I've been noticing a lot lately is that we really seem to, in our faith tradition, at least perhaps in others as well, um, maybe it's a human bias, uh, but we really seem to have a hesitation when it comes to aggressively seeking out truth, especially from unexpected places. Um, and I could, I could imagine that some people might say, why are we talking about ancient Egypt? Like they were polytheistic. They were idolaters. They were, you know, X, Y, and Z. What truth do they really have to offer us? Um, and so I wonder if you might share a couple of thoughts before we dive in again to talking about the Egyptian temple and what we can learn from there. Um, but would you mind sharing what are some of the attitudes and the characteristics maybe that we need to be a little bit more open to developing within ourselves so that we can be the recipients of great truth? Like what, what courage do we need or, or what open-mindedness, what, what would you suggest um, so that we don't stagnate in our spiritual growth, but that we can truly excavate truth from wherever it might be found? Yeah, uh, I think that was very well said. And it does take courage. Um, you know, we run a, a tour company and it, it's commonly said in that industry, you know, that travel broadens your horizons. Well, it'll broaden your horizons if you are willing to have your horizons broadened, right? That, that is a prerequisite for that happening. And it's so often, you know, the whole idea, if your glass is full, there's no room, there's not room to put anything else in there. So First of all, recognizing your own ignorance, because that's what study does for me. 
the more I learn, the more uh, I'm overwhelmed and baffled by the depths of my own ignorance, right? They are profound. And, um, but that's okay. It's exciting. It gives you the excitement to learn more, to, to know that there's so much more out there that you can discover. And as ever, I'm the greatest inhibitor to my own growth, right? Um, there's a, a really great documentary I recommend that you can find on YouTube called uh, Faith of an Observer about the life of Hugh Nibley. And there he says, you know, you're free to go as far as you want. And that, that's always been the case. Um, there's a uh, Greek philosopher and spiritual leader, Parmenides, who, who has a vision and he's being taken by these guides. And he specifies right at the beginning that he's only able to go as far as his longing takes him right? There's this limitation that we all seem to set. So like, how far are you willing to go? Like, what are you willing to learn? You know, what truths are you willing to learn? How far are you willing to, to go to learn those, to seek that out, right? What will you allow yourself to receive? Because that's what it seems so often to me, you know, uh, heaven just waiting for you, right? To say, I'm here. You, you, we just show up, right? I'm here. I'm all in. Often we, we get, uh, I don't know, I get fearful of new truths, but like truth is resilient. You know, we need to, the truth isn't fragile and we need to not be so fragile. And there's this idea, I think that some of us have that like, our spiritual connection is somehow fragile or the, the, the spirit and inspiration is fragile. And it definitely should not be that. If it is that for you, I would encourage you to look into that and see what you can do to improve that because it does not have to be this tenuous uh, connection. You can have a firm grasp to the spirit um, regardless of the outer circumstances around you. Because what's so critical as ever is, is what's inside, right? The internal connection. And um, yeah, I, um, I lost my uh, train of thought there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I get going and then uh, that's, that's kind of it. That's fine. I think but, you said some really profound well, things. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we said that... Uh, Truth, truth is the authority. That's a very Egyptian way of looking at things. Mat is their word for that. Truth, righteousness, what is correct, what is true. That's the, that's the dictator, right? That's what you're looking for. And that is the authority. And it seems there's this pattern through history that the less truth one has, the greater their reliance on some sort of claim to authority. Whereas having truth is its own authority. Like think of Jesus, right? When he comes, he's not, uh, he's not citing his rabbinical background and training and right, here's why you ought to listen to me because I hold such and such, you know, office or degree or whatever. And so you ought to listen to me. It's just truth. Abraham is the same way. You talked um, when we were communicating back and forth um, about, again, in uh, the LDS tradition where you know, it's stated in the Pearl of Great Price that, what, how does it describe it? That it's an earnest imitation, right? That, that for, for Egypt, right? It's an earnest imitation. And it goes on to ex explain that that imitation is performed by Pharaoh, who was a righteous man. Um, and somehow, you know, we think of that as denigrating. However, that's a pretty high compliment, in, in fact. Um, to be called righteous, I can't really think of higher praise. And in fact, Abraham himself, that's how he's defined as a seeker after righteousness and greater righteousness. He himself doesn't lay claim to authority because of some lineage that he has, right? In fact, Abraham is able to claim authority in spite of his lineage, you know, and because of his own seeking. He says he loved to search after God and the in the uh, apocalypse of Abraham, that's how it describes it. So that ever seeking, I, I hope that, um, and I think your audience definitely would, would have that appetite, right? Because your spirit is hungry and needs, it needs food. In, in Egypt, uh, the word for heart is eb, eb, right? Heart. And it's also the word for thirst, you know, and how your, 
your heart thirsts for more truth because that heart is that organ most sensitive to light and truth, which gets experienced as uh, love and like, pure knowledge, right? Sometimes unarticulable knowledge <laughs> that, that transcends language. But uh, yeah, th there's nothing to be afraid of there, right? The, the truth is super resilient. By inspecting it, you're not going to harm it. So don't be afraid of that. Now, you might harm your own suppositions, your own assumptions, uh, the own truths that you that you think you completely understand, that could be harmed. But frankly, you would want that to be harmed, right? In terms of getting rid of error and acquiring more and greater truth, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. So many, so many great thoughts in that. I love it. I love it so much because I think that one of the things that you kind of hit on is this idea that, um, you know, perhaps we're fearful of seeking out truth because we're afraid of being deceived. Right. And we want to, to, we want to claim that authority so that we feel like we were backed up. Like we have someone behind us who will verify what it is we're saying, even if what we're saying is not founded in truth. Um, and I think what's really interesting and what is the challenge for true disciples um, especially right now is to exactly as you were saying, see that if that is our behavior, if that is, um, if that's our inclination that I need some sort of authority to back this up, that really what that is, is exposing a way that I am not possessing truth or not connecting with God. Um, because God wants us to seek truth and, and he has said he will, share all that there is, all of the truth, all of the knowledge, all of the wisdom. And if you think about the experiences that people have had in the scriptures, people have had visions of all creation. Um, and he wants to give that to you, but he can't do it unless you're seeking. And in order to seek, you really have to lay aside that, that fear, that fear of, of being deceived and of having to have an authority behind you. The only authority that you need, as you said, is the fact that this is true and that I have been blessed to learn it, um, you know, by the grace of God. So Absolutely. Awesome. I mean, you're, it's, I get it. It is scary. You're, you're moving out of the kiddie pool, right? Out of the shallow end and into the deep and you got to tread a little water and, and not be afraid that fear really is super limiting and that fear tenses you up. It makes you anxious and it's just so much harder to receive and be communicated with, right? to listen to, you're creating all this static and dissonance that, that makes it hard to listen. Mm -hmm. And um, so be courageous. You know, um, I, I remember talking with people about the Apocrypha, studying Apocrypha, studying Pseudepigrapha, right? Because there's just so many books have been removed. <laughs> and there's so much that is available to us if, if we're willing to seek. So much has been discovered. And they're like, well, yeah, but there's a lot of error in there. There's, yes, there's truth, but there's also a little, little error and you have to be able to, you know, read with the, the spirit and discern. And it's like, well, well, yes. When isn't that the case? With what source isn't that the case for? Mm -hmm. They have really an a completely impeccable, pristine, perfect source, right? Other than a direct connection. So that's, that's always been the case. And you don't relinquish yeah, we're not just supposed to be mouth fed, right? Like a baby bird just waiting to, you know, you've got to present something. If you're in a, uh, a temple session or if you're in a church meeting or a sacrament, a Eucharist, whatever, and you're not feeling something, well, that doesn't mean it's on them, right? On the speaker or on the service or even the scriptures, right? If I'm reading the scriptures and not getting something out of it. Well, that's not necessarily an indictment of the, of the book, right? But more of myself. What are you bringing to bear? Because that, that's paramount. That means more than anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I fear that we have a little bit, again, just speaking about our faith tradition, and, and this is probably a broad generalization, so forgive me for that. But I feel like we do have this kind of unspoken spiritual arrogance because we we feel like we can claim authority and because we have been given so much truth. Um, and my fear is that that 
is actually becoming a limiting thing. Um, that because we have been the recipients of great knowledge and great truth, we are the ones who are saying a Bible, a Bible, we have a Bible and we don't need any more Bible <laughs> and apply that, apply that to truth. Okay. That was a super bold thing to say, but again, the point, the point is we need to have humility. We need to have courage. We need to realize that God wants to give us the secrets of the universe. If we are willing and faithful to receive them. Yeah, I, I find one of the most challenging and rewarding things is to approach something like I don't already know what I'm being told, you know? It can be so hard to read any scripture, especially if you've been raised in that or been around it a lot of times and heard so much commentary on it. Uh, that automatically kind of seeds into it and you feel like you know the story and you know the line and here's what I'm supposed to get out of it. But if you can try to read it with fresh eyes, like, hey, I don't know this. And so I, I say that to people on the tours all the time, because so many people just want, you know, that confirmation bias, right? They just want to be told what they already know. And I'm like, man, if you're not hearing anything new, this is a waste of your time. <laughs> you know, I'm not here to try to validate beliefs that you already hold. I mean, I'm sure many, many will be, but that's not the goal. I hope you'll hear something new uh, and not be afraid of that. Um, it, th that's okay to hear something new and you can sit with it and ponder it and pray about it and think about it. Mm -hmm. We get a lot of questions about how to um, deepen our study of the scriptures. And I think that all of this is, is the key to that. <laughs> one of the, one of the keys to, to answering that question. If you haven't felt like you are being, substantially spiritually fed from your study of the word of God, perhaps applying some of these principles will be helpful. Okay. So let's take everything that we just talked about. Cause that was a really, really fun detour. <laughs> um, and let's apply it. Let's apply it in our, our consideration of ancient Egypt. So again, setting aside any biases you might have, not just seeing this as an outdated, very outdated, ancient, um, irrelevant, uh, false culture, right? And instead, let's see perhaps what we have to learn from them. So Jared, can you give us a little bit of background on the Egyptian temple? And let's see if we can pull some threads about um, how it can impact our understanding of our modern day temples and our worship there. Yeah, uh, sure. For the Egyptians, uh, man, there is a lot to say about the temple, and they had a very rich um, ritual culture. For them, the, the temple is the center, right? You don't really have so much sacred and profane there, right? It's all sacred. Their whole culture is, especially, you know, if you approach it with that mindset, every aspect is, and yet still, the temple remains this, this central place for them and literally is envisioned as the center. And so this is a common theme you'll hear talked about with, with ancient temples everywhere, sacred places everywhere um, as a center, right? Or uh, and the omphalos, meaning the navel, okay? I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with that or have heard that, but it's the navel of the earth. They are all all of them are talked about that way, regardless of culture. That's, that's really uh, a broad reaching thing, okay? That it's the navel, it's the center, it's the point where creation began. And it's so funny because you'll have, you know, this temple says this is where creation began. And then that temple, you know, 10 miles up the river says that's where creation began. Well, it's, it's less a literal minded thing than, than with the creation of a temple, they are trying to reconnect with creation of, of the cosmos, right? Of the original primordial creation. And that's something I think, uh, you know, maybe LDS listeners aren't too surprised to hear that an emphasis on creation <laughs> is found in the temple, right? You're going back to that moment, okay? If one is seeking, rebirth or resurrection, moving to a new stage or a new phase, a logical place to begin that search is where 
birth and creation originally took place. Okay, so, so they're going to that center. And um, it's, it's often called the primordial mound or the mountain, a cosmic mountain. That's another theme of temples. Often you find them tiered. Um, with, with many levels. And it's this, uh, in the Egyptians, they talk about it being the first uh, mound or earth to emerge from the primordial waters. Okay, and they call those the noon, the waters of noon. That's, that's um, unorganized matter, okay? And then, so this land is, is organized. It is separated, it's differentiated, and it emerges in that first point of light, right? And so that's what, they're connecting with in the temple um, as, that, as that center. And an incredibly important concept, I think, to, to understand with Egypt, uh, and you find it everywhere, even in uh, early Christian scriptures too, is this idea of as above, so below. Okay, um, it's this reflection, this, this connection. So as above, so below. As within, so without. As the universe, so the soul. Um, the, the relationship between microcosm and macrocosm. And so we have the macro, the whole universe, and then the temple is, is a, uh, a model of that creation, okay? Um, and so by doing that, by modeling it, right, when they build a temple, they're orienting it very specific. All of it, by the way, is given by direction and revelation, they, they say. And they look back at the oldest sources and they are trying to constantly mimic the oldest things. And I mean that even by the ancient Egyptians, they themselves, the ancient Egyptians, thousands of years ago, engaged in like archeological pursuits and searched through ancient records. They were always trying to get back to that, uh, they call it the Septepi, okay? The first time, the golden age. Um, before the separation of humans and gods, okay? So they themselves were trying to be very true to what was originally given, like we talked about with the Pearl of Great Price and, and earnest imitation of that first thing, right? So they are spatially connecting with this mountain, right? You climb that mountain, you now have a grand perspective of everything, but it's also a temporal uh, return um, to that beginning point. Just like if you go to the temple, you are to consider yourself as Adam and Eve, right? It's very individual. You're an Adam. You're an Eve, right? You, here, here it is. This is, we talk about the omphalos, the center. Well, you are too, right? Megan, you be the center, right? You be that connecting point between heaven and earth. And that's how they talk about it with this navel and this connection. You see binding. You see uh, sealing, tying, and untying. Um, these things all associated with it, right? So this temple is this midpoint, and it's this knot that ties everything together, and it connects heaven and earth. Hmm. Oh, so much that I love about that. I, I really appreciate that last point um, that you were making, kind of this idea of, well, so first off, the idea of, the temple being the navel. Um, I love that because when you think about the symbolism there, not only is it a connection point, but it's a connection point between a child and their mother, which I think is really fascinating. Perhaps we can talk a little bit more, as you mentioned earlier, um, that the ancient Egyptian temple gave you so much insight into heavenly mother. Perhaps that's something that we need to be considering a little bit closer in our own temple worship. Um, but the idea of becoming a temple ourselves, um, and in the scriptures, it says, you are the temple of, of your body is a temple. Uh, you are the temple of your God. And I think that we, we kind of approach that concept, um, per, maybe a little bit from a more shallow perspective of saying, well, we need to be clean and we need to have the spirit and there's an emphasis on purity. And I think that that's all true, but the idea of me, myself becoming a connection between the temporal world that we currently are living in and God. Um, and what does that look like? Like, what does that look like? If I, if I become a temple, um, you know, I, and I think of Christ as the prototype, this idea of 
a God who descended into a temporal state in order to elevate everyone else um, so that they could have the opportunity to become gods. Um, it, it looks a lot like accepting that invitation. I think that Christ offers um, through the atonement, through ordinances and covenants, um, not just the outward appearance of them, not just the ritualistic um, physical manifestation of those things, but as an inward um, spiritual change that we that we become transformed uh, through the atonement. I think that that's really beautiful. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, um, that, that's huge. And again, that relates to the as above, so below, as within, so without, right? You, you're, you're 100% right. You are the temple. And, and in Egypt, that's, that point is really driven home. The temple was considered a living being. Okay, they had the in the foundation rights for it, the establishing of a temple. I mean, it goes through very similar rituals as birth. Okay, and it's thought of as being birthed, and it is even named, right? Uh, it's given various, uh, the parts of it are given attribute names of attributes of like living beings. Okay, every morning it's awoken, right? The priests and priestesses are singing hymns in there to literally wake up the temple every morning before they begin the, the rituals in there. Um, so, yeah, it is a living thing. Uh, in fact, you can even see um, the, the temple, sometimes it's named written within a cartouche, okay? The cartouche is that oval that you see the kings and queens, uh, their names are in it, right? So yeah, very, very uh, powerful depiction, of, you know, know you not that ye are the temple of God, right? Like your name, that's what you're meant to be, this temple. So, so absolutely. And there's a really big work, uh, two volume work called the Temple of Man. Uh, done by uh, Schwaller de Lubix <clears throat> that literally goes into that. And he's just analyzing one temple, uh, the Temple of Luxor. And I mean, it's a, this is a massive work, but it's fascinating where he uh, studies the language and the inscriptions and the way that they use uh, sacred geometry in particular to show exact correspondences between the temple and the human body. Okay, like literally it's the same proportions and laid out and lots of ways to look at it and like i said this is a two volume work so there's a lot a uh, lot there but um so how are you that temple what do you take from that i mean right off the bat uh, i'm thinking of the temple of, of karnak in um in egypt it's the second largest temple complex in the world and it's aligned to um the equinox okay which is something very common in ancient temples uh in fact Temple of Solomon was the same way on the equinox. You could open the gates and the sun would shine straight through into the Holy of Holies. Well, that's straight out of Egypt. So you've got this centermost shrine, the innermost shrine, and it's this, this Holy of Holies. And at Karnak, it's beautiful. Uh, it has doors on both sides of it, and you open it uh, on this equinoctial day, right? And the sun, the rising sun, shines directly into there, into the heart of the temple where it, everything can be energized and renewed so it is literally this heart receiving light and truth right and how that is uh, uh, the the process of renewal mm. um you know temples had libraries anciently um that was a major function of them that they they called that the per -ankh, the house of life the House of Life, it's where they kept all of their sacred writings and they were kept very um, securely and safely and treasured and cherished there. And the scribes would copy them and try to protect them as best they could. And um, they were very, th these writings were just held enormously sacred. And those are in the temple. And so of course, right there, you've got, yes, you've got the level of meaning there that this is a place of learning. It's, a, you know, that's what it's meant to be. You don't go to the temple and just be a, a brain dead observer right you're supposed to be applying your intellect and your spiritual effort there and getting something out of it right um so there's that it's a house of learning but if we take this further right to this intriguing idea of you being the temple and there's a library within you right there's there is a storehouse of 
knowledge within you. If you approach this from the perspective of my existence didn't start at birth, right? But that I existed before I came down here. And as life is a, a descent from a heavenly home to here, well, I've had some sort of range of experiences and growth and learning before I ever arrived in this place, right? Um, and that is an Egyptian conception, right? They would consider themselves co-eternal with the gods. They're of the same substance, right? That intelligence and life that's not created, that it just is eternal and emerges from that same place that they do. So you have this affinity with the gods and with them, you're seeing your, your future. But back to that library, if that library is within you, it's like what we were talking about, about being afraid or, or, or going to that deep end. It's, it's so easy to look for knowledge outside of ourselves. And that's fair and that's okay. Um, but to rely solely on that, you're missing a huge part of it, right? Which is a huge ingredient is what's in yourself. And the irony of, of us not being able to trust ourselves sometimes, right? That, that we tend to um, minimize our own insights, our own knowledge, our own impressions, right? Oh, I don't know. It's so easy to brush them off, right? And minimize them. But uh, if you take it seriously and approach it with a little bit of courage and faith um, to plunge those inner depths, there's a lot that you've come here with already, right? And so then learning becomes less about discovery and more about recovery, right? Of recognition of things that you've already known. Yeah. I love that. Well, and I, I think it relates really well to what you're talking about earlier as the temple being a center of the noon. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and to me that, that primordial, um, unorganized creative space and material, I mean, that's the spirit, that's truth. That's the word. Um, that is the light of Christ. And we are centers of that we are spiritual beings that are endowed with the capacity to connect with the eternal sphere through this spirit, um, through that, uh, energetic force that is in all things and through all things. And that makes up all things. Um, so I love the idea of, again, talking about us becoming a temple is relearning how to tap into that, how to get beyond just our physical sensations, um, to really access the, the, the ethereal, everything <laughs> that is, that is available to us, that surrounds us, that is inside of us. Um, I think that that's really beautiful. Can you talk a little bit more? You know, one of the things you talked about is the, the temple being this return to creation or recreation. Can you talk about the Egyptian attitude of life, death, and rebirth and what that cycle looks like and, and how maybe how that can apply to our understanding of the purpose of the temple as well. Sure. Yeah. Um, in Egypt, it's probably less accurate to say uh, they're moving toward new life. You'd probably rather say they're moving to new lives or more life lives, you know, um, a, really important part of the temple symbolism, not just in Egypt, but everywhere, is the idea of a journey. Um, often you'll see labyrinths associated with even cathedrals or temples. Um, yeah, it's this journey with trials, with ups and downs, that with blind alleys, right? And sometimes you have to backtrack and um, you know, to navigate a, a labyrinth, there's really kind of three ways to do that. One, you have a shortcut, you know, and you're the super rare shortcut that, you know, is kind of the exception, not the rule where you're able to just go straight to the center. Or more likely, like I said, you're having to weave around and try to navigate your way and you go, you know, you hit dead ends and you have to backtrack and you're, you know, you're trying to feel your way through this thing to the center. And then the third option is you yeah, just get lost in the maze, right? And you never find it. There's a lot of parallels there to um, a vision of the tree of life, right? With Lehi and, and, you know, think of him kind of getting that shortcut, right? With him, he just hears. 
he just hears the voice and goes straight to it. He just goes straight to the tree. There's no rod yet for him, you know? He just hears that and has that direct connection and goes straight to the tree. And it's only when he's looking back at Laman and Lemuel hoping, oh, if only there was some way for these guys to make it. And then he sees this rod that's able to bring them there. And then, of course, there are some who just wander and get lost. So this is a major, um, a major theme. You change rooms as you go through a temple, right? There's this series of rooms. They're, you're, they're discussed in terms of running, running a race, right? That's common uh, terminology found in the New Testament as well, right? Running a race. Um, but you're, you're, you're moving from one place to another and you're passing gates and partitions and veils as you move closer and closer to the center. And so in the temple, you are literally climbing. You're getting higher and higher. So um, as a place of beginning, um, the Nile in Egypt is everything, right? And, and, and once a year, the Nile floods completely. And I mean, it literally drenches the land of Egypt, okay? So the whole thing is shimmering. It breaks its banks, and they rely on that for their agriculture and everything. And, and your homes now become like islands because the water is everywhere. And the water comes right up to the temples. Um, and so you get this really stark image. They were built on slightly high points, but it is that primordial mound emerging from the waters. Literally, the waters are right there, right? And so you're passing through all of these experiences. And in, in Egypt, uh, as well as other temples, light plays a major part in signaling that movement, right? In Egypt, you're going further and further into the darkness, okay? Uh, alone and dreary world, or even more accurately, you're going into the darkness of that primordial time, okay? Of, of uh, matter unorganized, right? And so that's what that inner sanctuary is like that. You're going into darker and darker recesses. As the floor rises, the ceiling drops and everything kind of focuses into this, right? And it gets darker and darker, but that's not where it ends. That's where you have your experience of at one moment with the gods, okay? But then you reverse course and you come back out, right? The entrance is the exit. And now you're facing the east, the rising sun, right? As you exit to greater light and ascending glory okay so that's the idea there it's this constant journey with light being a, a major theme and in that darkness you have to provide your own light if, if that makes sense right you could think of well oil is a common uh symbol in the temples as and lots of levels of meaning but surely one would be oil as symbolic of light or even like liquid light kind of a thing and so if you can think of the New Testament where these, you know, the 10 versions have to provide their own oil for their light, right? You have to have that. You provide that as you go into the darkness, that, that eternal part of you that's simultaneously the most ancient and the most childlike part of you, right? Uh, and how that light now activates on the darkness. And there's this creation. It's not a darkness that represses, that tries to pull you down and drag you down in, in some sort of evil, chaotic way. This is a darkness that sh shimmers and is iridescent, right? Mm -hmm. It's from, right, it's born, and it's very often associated with the feminine, right? Like the darkness of a womb, a, again, a watery place. Um, hmm. you, you had mentioned the, the navel and um, th there is an interesting connection there. Um, uh, I have a lot of thoughts I'm trying to, <laughs> to focus in here. Um, there's a tool. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the splitter, it's called the flint splitter. Um, and it's, it's uh, shaped like this, right? And they use it literally to cut umbilical cords of babies, okay? So it's, think of a knife, stone knife that's shaped like that, okay? And so they can just get right through the umbilical cord like that. Well, it's said that that's used on us when we're born, right? You are separated, which is part of the plan because you can't grow if you're just gonna stay attached to your mom, right? You have to have that cut um, so you can 
you know, freely eat of all these trees and have experiences, right? And learn the difference between dark and light and good and evil and, and yeah, learn through your own experience, right? So that's severed, but it severs you from your own identity and memory. And there's this huge forgetting, right? We talk about that as a veil, like this body even can be considered a veil as something that, that, that separates you and keeps you from that memory. Um, and so what, you know, the Greeks call it drinking from the waters of Leith, right? The waters of forgetting. And in the temple, there's a, a ritual done to restore that connection. And they call it the opening of the mouth. And so these, these um, it is a ritual where uh, these various instruments are used by the priests and they touch uh, very specific body parts, right? They touch your eyes, they touch your ears, they touch your mouth, your nose, your back, uh, you know, your arms and your hands are touched, your legs and your feet, etc. Okay, all these parts are touched to be reactivated. And it's this idea of reconnecting, right? Of remembering who you are. That's the idea. Hopefully that is an actual experience that happens in the temple, right? Where there's this literally an awakening, right? The Egyptians say that, awake and arise, you sleepers, okay? Uh, you can imagine an initiate that has his eyes closed as a sleeper and is being told to awake and arise. And the pyramids, um, this is, uh, you know, one of the things that is conjectured in terms of ritual that may have taken place in the pyramids where you have this this descent down into the depths of the darkness, right? You're moving toward the west and the south, these places where, you know, the stars are setting in the south, the, the sun sets in the west, or, or the southern stars, I should say, set versus the northern stars that, that are always up there, okay? The imperishable, the immortal stars. Uh, sorry, I know I'm going off on a tangent here, but uh, mm -hmm. you're going down into the darkness. There's a sepulcher, okay? And you can imagine a king or an initiate or a queen, actually, um, also, they have their own pyramids, um, might be placed in there as though they were dead or as though they were asleep, waiting to be awoken, okay, and being told to awake and to arise. And as they do, right there on that wall next to them uh, is this pyramid text that is associating all these body parts with Atum. Okay, and it says your, your uh, shoulders are as atom, your arms and hands are as atom, your belly is as atom, your legs and feet are as atom, okay? And atom is an incredibly rich word for them. It has tons of levels of meaning. Um, it, it is the name of this God who descends, okay, who enters mortality, essentially, um, but it's also, and is in need of renewal, right? But the word also literally means uh, complete. It means whole. It means many, entire, okay? Um, the universe, conversely, the same word can also mean end, <laughs> perish, cease, die, hush, to close the mouth, okay? So, Right there, just in his name alone, you've got this idea of one who's had that closing of the mouth, one who perishes, many, but he's many, right? He is everyone. And he enters into this mortality, right? This corruptibleness where there is death. But it's also the idea of being able to put on incorruption, okay? Of being changed of being so all of these parts as they're being touched they're also being they're acknowledging their perishability but also being bestowed and blessed with imperishability with wholeness with perfection and on yet another level they're being compared to the universe right your arms your hands are the universe you are the universe it's it's within you, you there's an affinity and similarity there uh, i know that's a lot there <laughs> No, oh, I love it. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. And I see, I don't, I don't even want to like point out the similarity <laughs> um, between our temple worship and that. I just, I hope that people can hear it and let the spirit testify and teach you um, about this earnest imitation, um, this, this attempt at 
establishing a priesthood pattern that the Egyptians had that's so beautiful and teaches us so much. One question that I had come to mind, you know, as we've talked about, we talk about all these ritualistic things um, that they're, that they're journeying through the temple, that there's all this symbolism, that there are these specific rites that they're participating in. Was there an understanding, like, did they believe that just going through the temple and, and worshiping by participating in these rites, was that sufficient for them? Or was there an understanding that this was a pattern that was supposed to be applied outside of their temples? Um, I'm really curious about that. Right. So, um, yeah, that's a good question. The, the temple is in one level, it's the menu, not the meal, right? It's, it's the symbol, not the reality. Um, you know, yeah, there's a priest here on the other side of this veil or this partition, okay? But the reality is, is that's going to be a heavenly guardian and ultimately your, your Lord, right? That, that you're gonna pass through. And so you're being taught a, a heavenly culture, a pattern, that, that you will encounter. So that's, that's one level of it being taught that. But absolutely, they were expected to be having direct experience. I mean, when you set aside commentary that, that people can get a little, uh, you know, sensitive about those things. But when you read the actual text, the actual Egyptians, how they talk about it, they talk about having direct experience with the divine in their temples. Um, and that being their hope. Right. Um, yeah, there, there's so, so many different directions to go with that, but they're trying to experience this at one minute with their God. And that often happens at that veil, gate or partition. So how do I say that? Um, Gates for them, one of the words in, in, in one of the texts where you're where you are traveling to make this ascent in this uh, text called the Amdua, the gates are called knives. Okay, knives. They they separate, they cut, you know, they are a petition, a partition. Um, but also there's cutting that that goes on there. Um, and for an LDS audience, that may not be quite as foreign as it as it might seem, right? I mean even in Hebrew, they talk about cutting a covenant, right? And, and, and um, how sacrifice and, and cutting various members was part of this. And this cutting is leaving marks, okay? And um, think of approaching a veil. You are a mirror image of that veil, of that boundary, of the guardian. You have to match, right? Otherwise, you're not getting through. You're matching. And in the early Christian tradition, you have Christ is literally seen as the veil, okay? They compare the veil to Christ and you match him often with literal marks that you have on there, um, often five uh, marks. Um, and so those things meet up and are matched at the veil. And um, gosh, you know, before the 1920s, um, even in, in the LDS tradition, there was cutting that was performed at the veil, right? Uh, you went with certain clothing on, and then the marks were cut there. Um, so they were cut into that, and then you would later sew those up. So you get this kind of raised embroidered feel to the thing. And I mean, what a powerful symbol of atonement, of at one moment, of that healing of a rift, right? Because there is this rift, this membrane that's brought back together. Um, yeah, and then you have the marks of Christ with, within you, right? That's a really big uh, Christian, Christian theme. And the Egyptians are no different. They identified with their Lord Osiris, who is the dying and resurrecting God. And they mimic him. Even the rites of mummification are, are done that way. Their death is meant to be seen the same way, where he's cut up and put into pieces. He's dismembered, okay? But then he's reattached he's brought back together again that corruption putting on incorruptibility his head needs to be tied or fastened onto his body right 
You might have something tied to you to do that or tied around your waist, binding these things together. Okay. Um, yeah, and so you are completely matching. You are this mirror image. Uh, like in the Gospel of Philip, where it talks about the mirrored bridal chamber as the, the highest place, right? That mirrored can also be translated as duplicate, okay? Which, fine, it's, it's both, right? It doesn't have to be an either-or thing. Mirrors and duplication, reflection, it's a reflection of a higher reality. You are seeing in a mirror, hopefully, your higher self of what you can become, when it's associated with a bridal chamber in particular, you're looking at your other half, yourself, you're seeing her or him and as like a mirror, right? As the rest of me. Um, yeah, there, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of beautiful things with that. And that veil is separating, it's protecting a place from those who are not authorized to go beyond or to look, right? And it's very often associated with the female and with the feminine, okay? Veils and the feminine kind of go together there. Um, and one doesn't just lift the veil, she lifts that herself, right? And um, she grants access and gives access to that in Egypt. It would also in Egypt be a reference to her, the divine feminine, the, the, the mother, the spouse. She is um, often called the eye, right? The eye of Ra, the eye of Horus, um, the Wejat eye, the whole, the perfect eye. And so we often see that eye being given to an initiate. The eye represents the totality of divine gifts or any one gift that's needed to reach totality and perfection, right? Uh, of power even, um, of glory, of all those things. So it's not complete. None of that is complete without her. Um, yeah, she has to be there or you're not receiving the fullness of, let's say, priesthood or glory or, or power or influence, whatever, right? You're, you're not receiving that perfection until the two are together and made, made as one flesh, right? Made whole. Um, so, so in that way, she can also be a veil. And, and with that eye, then uh, the, the Egyptian texts talk about Hathor in particular is often associated with, with vision and her ability to gift an initiate, a king or a queen with vision. And literally by that, I mean heavenly vision, right? Specifically not temporal mortal vision but a higher vision that's often symbolized by a blindfold, a hood or a veil, because it's not these eyes, right? Um, you know, if you go to the East, you're talking about now a third eye tradition, right? Where this third eye is between these and it's above these, right? It's higher than this vision. And so with this veiling, she is tapping into something else, right? This other vision. And that is what's gifted to a king or a queen is this ability to see into the eternities in either direction, the eternities past and the eternities future encompassed in this one <laughs> eternal now. And this stuff starts getting really difficult to talk about and explain, right? In terms that we can grasp uh, because it is so transcendent and it can just sound kind of goofy to talk about sometimes when you try to bring it down to this level. But um, yeah, that would be an, yet another way that she's associated with, with veils that way. Mm. So can you talk a little bit about, cause so now we're really getting into the role of, of women and divine feminine in the temple versus the divine masculine and men. So for the journey for an initiate, how was it different for a man going through the masculine temple and a woman going through this feminine aspect of the temple? Uh, well, as far as I know, in Egypt, there's, there's not much of a difference. Um, they use the same texts. Um, so, for instance, uh, those, those pyramid texts, that, that uh, those would be considered the oldest religious writings in the world, right? The carved versions that we have date to at least 24, 2500 BC, but it's acknowledged universally that those are just copies of much older stuff, okay? It says, here's the stone copy we have, and they're like selections from a much bigger text that we don't have anymore or, or haven't found yet. 
But those texts um, are about uh, making that ascent to rejoin the family of the gods. When I was talking about, you know, you being identified with Atum and stuff, that is in those pyramid texts. Okay, there's lots of beautiful, beautiful texts in there. Um, those are in pyramids for kings and those are in pyramids for queens. And we find section of those texts. It, it used to be thought that that was, a, that, that was reserved strictly for royalty, but that's now been shown not to be the case. They have found uh, entire intact texts and, and others, right, that were not royal in their tombs and such. So it wasn't reserved just for them. It's just that's where we find the grandest, fullest expression of it. But for the feminine, uh, for a queen going through, um, as far as I can think of right off the top of my head, they just literally are just changing the pronouns from mm -hmm. masculine to feminine. And there's nothing denied them. But, but, but there is this element of needing each other, right? The, the masculine and the feminine um, at a certain point, right? It, it can be individual, but at a certain point, there is this coming together. And she was participated in those rites. And so we start to get into speculation because these things were kept very sacred and secret, right? And so we don't have like, just here's how it laid out. You kind of have to read between the lines with the text, but um, there's a lot of indications and plenty of scholars acknowledge that is very likely that um, if it's the king, for instance, in that sepulcher, right? Awaiting his being awakening, that she plays a very big part in that. Um, she is there, the queen is there um, as that primordial counterpart. And you find that universally with the gods. Uh, the pyramid texts again say that there is no star god without his companion. Um, even the very, their very names, right? Like um, Amun would be the most high god, the, the hidden, hidden one is often how that's translated. Um, Again, from an LDS perspective, uh, Joseph Smith often used that term Amen, right? Or Sun Amen or Adamandi Amen, right? This is, was a term that he used, Amen, um, signifying the Most High God. Well, he has his counterpart that's Amunet, Amunet. The, the T ending is, is how you feminize a word in, um, in Egyptian, right? So it's like saying like, I don't know, Smurf and Smurfette, <laughs> okay? You had Amen and you had his exact counterpart, Amunet. Okay, and that goes across the board, you find that, where they all have their feminine counterpart. So you have all this most high father and mother, and then you also have a son and a daughter um, beneath them. And, and both of those would be, uh, you know, salvific prototypes for mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Really, really interesting. So, so we talked a little bit about um, the feminine, the divine feminine playing a role at the veils and at these gates, at these points of transition. Um, what, like, what other kind of, I don't want to say division of responsibilities, because I think that there, my understanding is that there's a unity, as you were saying, like there's a counterpart. Um, and so it's more like two halves of a whole than it is. This is my thing. And this is your thing. Um, but like what other roles and responsibilities did the did these prototypical gods and goddesses play in the role of moving an initiative or initiate initiative yeah 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 an initiate uh-huh initiate thank you um in in terms of moving an initiate through this journey through the temple what yeah. was the father what was his role and then what was the mother and her role in that whole process well, the, the feminine, and again, this is actually one of those really universal things you find where she's the one who gets things going, right? Well, even when we talk about Adam and Eve, right? And trying to keep in mind this story as being symbolic and not trying to grab hold too literally of, of some portrayal we may be familiar with, but um, she gets things kicked off, right? She's moving Adam out of the comfort zone. Um, it can very well be said, and several scholars have, have said this, that she's initiating him, right? That, so that they can become as the gods, right? And that is the result. Behold, they are become as one of us, right? Like that is, that is the goal. So that they can move and like, let's, let's keep things moving and not stagnate 
she's often the one who's initiating that. And you see that in Egypt where she kicks things off. Um, I talk about that a bit in my video when I was showing that the, the Manat necklace that she offers, um, that adoration, that transferal, that invitation to, okay, let's, let's move, right? She's often a guide. We find that uh, again, all over the place. You, I mean, you find these things in Samaria and Babylon and um, Assyria. You find it in the Greek, right? Um, even think of like um, Theseus going through that labyrinth. Well, he's only able to do that with Ariadne, right? Um, I mean, it, it just goes on and on. There are a ton of examples of this. Um, but yeah, she's, she's getting things moving. She's associated with navigating that. Um, with uh, successfully um, in those places of darkness, in those moments of vulnerability and transition, she is the protection force, the protecting force in, in, uh, in Egypt. She's that fire spitting cobra. She's a lioness. I mean, she is his protection, right? And is before and behind him, surrounding him with, with fire, with glory, you know? Um, so she protects. She meets him in the, in the Amduat um, when he's at that deepest, darkest point. Uh, and I'm talking about Osiris there or an initiate as Osiris. It's Isis, his wife, who comes and brings fire. She brings light to that darkness, to that place, and is facilitating at one minute with the most high God there that would then bring about resurrection. And so she is uh, very often associated, of course, with, with rebirth and with resurrection as one would assume, right? She's associated with, with weaving. Um, the feminine and her priestesses wove the veils of the temple, right? There's even a tradition of, of the Virgin Mary doing that in her youth, that that's what she, you know, she was brought into the temple and wove the veils. Well, of course, right? Like what is a female doing with the life in her, right? She is weaving. And again, think of robes because this is a huge theme in, in ancient religion that robes, clothing, those are symbols of body, right? A coat of skins, it's a body. So it's significant that you might be changing these, that you might be taking it off. In Egypt, we see that all the time. There's always a change of wardrobe. You see sandals they're, they had white slippers or sandals that they're removing and putting back on robes that they're taking on and putting off and changing and they're they're different as they move through right um <laughs> yeah moving from grace to grace here a little there a little you know and and i'm progressing as joseph says they're moving from exaltation to exaltation uh which is a pretty deep concept if you think about it there's a lot beneath the surface there to consider. Um, but yeah, that's what they wanted to do was join the company of the gods. And um, yeah, you have them just always together. They overcome adversity together. They overcome everything that's trying to stop that forward momentum and that, that, that movement up, right? It, it, it's done together to the point that, um, I mean, even in the construction of the temples, you'll see the stones, right? the stones that they use can even be associated symbolically with male or female, right? Like you often see granite as an igneous rock and a fiery rock associated with the male. And you have maybe like limestone or alabaster created through the action of water as associated with the female. So you have that masculine and feminine coming together. Even in a temple, you won't, you're not going to find a temple or a pyramid that's made of only that one stone. They always have that other element there, even if it's primarily limestone or sandstone, they'll bring in some granite into it or vice versa, right? So you always have that male and female. And again, those doors, the doors, the thresholds that you're passing through, those, you find these amazing megalithic stones, these massive, like tens of tons, these huge granite, red granite slabs that are the thresholds to these temples, all of the doors, virtually. I, I actually can't think of them except them. I'm sure there is one, but I can't think of it. But they're all red granite, right, that you pass through. 
And when we're there, I, I tell people, because it's so easy to just be a mindless tourist, right? I mean, there's so much to see. It's, it's amazing and it's fun. And it's easy to kind of get lost in that and just walk in. And I'm like, hey, hold on. You're walking into a place that would have taken years to prepare to go into, right? And only a few would have been privileged to go in there. And each one of these thresholds, like pass that with intention, be deliberate about it because that's what's required. They are red granite, so it's fiery. It's this fiery gate, um, which fire is like glory for them. Um, there's a wonderful text. This used to really get to me when I was trying to translate the pyramid text. Uh, there's this lake of fire that you go to and you can translate it. The word goes either way. It goes, welcome to the lake or beware the lake. And I'm like, well, which is it? Welcome or beware? Do I go to the thing? Or do I not go to the thing? Well, actually, the fact that it's both is perfect because it's like that glory. It totally depends on you and what you're bringing to it, what you can take, what you're, you know, if you match, if you are meant to be there, then yeah, welcome, right? This is great. And it's purifying and revivifying and it's this wonderful experience. And if you're not ready yet, if this isn't for you, then yikes, you know, beware. Don't, that's not gonna be a pleasant experience for you. Beware the lake. And so these thresholds are very much the same way. And when you pass these gates in Egypt, by the way, yes, you have a guide that, that's, that's bringing you, but there's no like kindly helper uh, like telling you what the right thing to do and say to get through the gate. They are guardians, right? Their job is to guard, to only permit who's supposed to be in there if you match. So you have to assert your belonging, okay? Does that make sense? Which, which only comes from knowing who you are, right? Know thyself. That's why it's such a huge deal to know yourself. And you can only know your... Lord, the, the Sufis have a saying like that, you know, he who knows himself knows his Lord, right? Like, like is comprehended by like, like is attracted to like, like is comprehended by like. That's a deceptively simple statement. To be comprehended, to be understood, to know God is eternal life. To do that, you have to be like them. And that happens in these small incremental steps and these phases. It's from exaltation to exaltation. Uh, the epistle of Barnabas in the early Christian tradition says from eternity to eternity, right? This is a huge, a huge theme. And um, yeah, so you have to know who you are, have confidence in that. And um, in Egypt, you always see the king striding forward, right? He's got that left foot just moving forward. And it's all about that movement and that courage. As you talked about at the very beginning, to seek more truth, it takes courage. You have confidence in yourself. Yeah, I might be stepping into the dark here. You are, you're stepping into the unknown by definition, right? Passing through that gate, it's going to be unknown on the other side. But it's experiential and you have to, to taste of that. You've got to move through, right? Mm. Um, and yeah, like I said, you assert yourself. I belong. You're recognized. You're recognized in Egypt. You're recognized by that, that son of the most high. You're recognized primarily by the mother. Because it, uh, Nibley talked about that when he, uh, in his wonderful discussion on patriarchy and matriarchy, he talks about how it's, well, in a very practical standpoint, uh, she's the only one who can tell you who the father is, right? If this is a legitimate son or not, if this is a legitimate daughter or not, if this child is a true child, right? So she can tell you that. So she recognizes you. Isis, um, the, the, the goddess, she's called in Egypt, she who knows all the names. And names is a big deal in, in Egypt, a very, very big deal. And it's part of your identity, part of like, like they put it, equate it with like the soul, the spirit, your body, your name. It's like a huge integral part of you. And in rituals, they would receive a new name, um, which was, you know, done through inspiration or even something that was remembered or revealed to them. So you might be taught a pattern of a higher reality that, yeah, you have another name, you know, you, this isn't your, you know, you didn't just start from here, right? You have some identity that, that you've brought with you. And so there's this name there. And so being able to recognize, oh, actually, let me read. Can I read something real quick? This mm -hmm. is great. This is from um, 
the gospel of Thomas, okay? And so these are the words attributed to Jesus. And, and so this is from like, you know, the Nagamati um, scriptures that were found uh, in 1945 and like early Christian documents that were all removed uh, from the Bible. And these were protected and hidden up because they were being killed for their beliefs, right? Most scholars now say that the gospel of Thomas predates the four canonical gospels that we have, that they probably drew on this as a source. So just for a little context about what this is. But Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says that um, you will find the kingdom for you are from it and to it you will return. And then he talks about how to address these guardians, right, that, that might be trying to keep you from going in or who are manning the gates. If they say to you, where did you come from? Say to them, we came from the light, the place where the light came into being on its own accord and established itself. If they say to you, is it you? Say, we are its children and we are the elect of the living father. If they ask you, what is the sign of your father in you? Say to them, it is movement and repose. It is movement and repose, that descent and ascent, that going out and coming back, right? That, again, that movement. But you're going back to where you come from. Hermes, um, the Greek version of, of, uh, of the Egyptian stuff essentially comes to that. He says, uh, rise, rise from your sleep of ignorance. Realize that your home is not on the earth, but in the light, right? Or there's a, um, uh, that mentor that I talked about earlier, John Hall, uh, translated the, the Orphic dictum from, from Greek, where they would say, uh, I am a child of earth and of the starry heavens, but my race is of heaven alone, right? And you're literally saying that to these guardians and then requesting to drink from the fountains of memory. You know, so yeah, you're, you're asserting your identity. That's a long way of saying that, right? Of knowing you came from the light and you're returning to it. That's so beautiful. And I, and I think that you're right. I think it brings this conversation whole circle is that we, we have to possess truth. The most important truth being who we are and who God is and what our relationship to God, our heavenly parents can be what it's meant to be. Um, I think that's so beautiful and we can't rely on any other authority. It just has to be this ingrained, understood, claimed, confident truth that we know because we have discovered it for ourselves. And I love that, that definition of no, you know, in the scriptures, we kind of think of that as a, as an obtuse, you know, mental recognition of something. Um, but in reality and, and specifically in the Hebraic and in Greek traditions that, um, founded our scriptures to know was to experience. It was to have an understanding because I've been there because I went there because I descended yeah. and then I ascended with the help of my savior. Um, so I, I find that so beautiful. There's so much more, like there's so much, I, I could spend hours talking to you, um, but we don't have that time. So if someone wanted to know more, um, to kind of pull at some of these threads for themselves and maybe see how, how much more you can apply the Egyptian temple worship to our own understanding of the temple and what we should be gaining by experiencing, by becoming temples in our everyday what resources would you recommend for the earnest seeker of truth? Um, well, I, I really can't think of a better source than, than Hugh Nibley. Um, he's phenomenal. And whenever I start feeling a little big for my britches, I just read him and I'm like, oh man, something I thought I was clever for, for seeing. Uh, and he was there, you know, 60 years ago, I saw the same thing. I just wasn't uh, sharp enough to pick it up the first time I read him. But uh, yeah, his complete collected works are pretty hard to beat. And he's written a lot of stuff on Egypt. Um, but there's so much. And, and so that's a good way to get your feet wet. But like, look at the footnotes. When you find a good source, look at the footnotes, particularly with Nibley. There's a lot of good stuff kind of buried in the footnotes there. But then you start looking at those sources because, I mean, and I know that can sound intimidating. That's why I like to just be like, ah, you know, start with Nibley, right? But like, um, there are, uh, ideally you start getting to the primary sources, right? And look at those. So you're moving away from somebody else's commentary. That's nice. And it's a good place to get you started. 
But as I said, you kind of start having to tread in the deep end, right? And, and get away from that. And you can still look at it. We're meant to teach and edify one another. That, that's, that's great. Like, let's help each other out, but don't neglect that, like what you have in you. And, and like I said, it's all trivia without direct experience, right? Without that recognition or memory. So you really can find that with the direct primary sources. So like the actual pyramid texts or, or um, gosh, even early Christian texts. Don't, don't be afraid to dive in, go for it. And if something's unfamiliar, that doesn't mean that it's just, oh, well, that's, I've never heard that. That must not be right. You know, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> you know, you know, it could still be right. And you've never heard it. Like, give it a second, you know, sit with it and investigate it. You don't have to necessarily make a decision right away on everything. Right. Thank you. Yeah. And don't, and you don't have to be content. Like, I, I hear this argument all the time of, of kind of what you were just saying. Like, if that was important for us to know, we would have heard it from someone or from somewhere. And the fact of the matter is that there's so much truth that the Lord's not going to give you unless you want it. And yeah. unless you demonstrate that you want it and you do need it. Like the, I hope that you see that too, as we've been talking about this, the, uh, just such a dynamic and intricate and deep symbolically deep representation that was just the temple in ancient Egypt. Like, I hope that we to see this and see that there are depths that we need to be willing to go um, so that we can ascend, right? Christ yeah. ascended above all things because he descended below all things. And we can take that as a pattern for our own learning, I think, is that the deeper that we're willing to go, the higher we have the potential to ascend. Um, and so I, I hope that we have introduced, I hope Jared's introduced to you listeners, um, some places that you can go in your study. And if you feel the spirit lead you to, um, I pray that you will, and, and don't be afraid of seeking out knowledge wherever it can be found and it can be found just about anywhere. So any final thoughts you'd like to share? Uh, I mean, I a hundred percent agree that descent precedes the ascent and, um, asking is a key right there's so much stuff that's withheld until we ask that's the pattern that's a key and the question is just as important if not more important often than the answer mm -hmm. having the question uh, and the willingness to ask I think. <laughs> the the yeah. humility face and the courage it, right honestly yeah. face it, to be like man just i just want that truth and that loyalty above all to what's true it's correct to ma right yes Yes, absolutely. Well, Jared, thank you so much. This is, again, I could spend hours with you, <laughs> um, but so appreciate what you've been able to share today. Yeah, you bet. My pleasure. Thanks, Megan. Love this episode and the Latter-day Disciples mission? You can show your support by rating and reviewing, sharing this episode with a friend, checking out our volunteer opportunities on latterdaydisciples.com, and donating to our cause. 100% of donations are used just for the purpose of covering our operating expenses. We take no money in our own pockets. Your support is invaluable to us, no matter what form you choose to show it. Thank you for being our fellow disciples of Jesus Christ. There are great days ahead for those who love the Lord, and we can't wait to share them with you.